Hi there, and thank you for joining my talk, What the AST? I like starting my talks off with a question. Um, and I know raising, raising your hand in this uh, virtual talk is really difficult, um, but I still want you to either participate in the chat or at least uh, you know, think about this question. Have you ever used uh, one of these tools, Angular, Webpack, ESLint, Prettier, Parcel, Vue, TypeScript, Babel? Um, because in the next 30 minutes, I want to talk to you about what these tools have in common, what they're using under the hood, uh, why these concepts are useful for you to know, uh, even if you're not trying to build the next ESLint, Webpack, or similar tool and also why it's just generally useful to have this in your tool belt. Before we start, I wanna briefly introduce myself. My name is Dominic. I work as a developer evangelist at a company called Twilio. If you haven't heard of Twilio, we're a cloud communications platform, meaning we have APIs and SDKs to allow you to integrate different means of communication, such as voice, video, SMS, email, two-factor authentication, or similar into your applications. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and you can find me anywhere on the internet under dkundal. So feel free to send me an email or a DM on Twitter. Um, so I want you to think about how do we modify and find code on a regular basis. Typically, the way at least it works for me, if I'm trying to find something in my project and I'm trying to batch fix it, is the first thing I'm going to try is Command or Control F. Uh, that works pretty well if you're trying to find like one, a variable once. The moment you're trying to use it more often and you're trying to replace it in a bunch of files, it, get, uh, it gets more tricky and you're starting to try to fiddle around with settings and hoping that you're not modifying too much or too little and that your tests hopefully will catch any things you might be breaking. And so that can be incredibly frustrating, especially if you have to do the same thing multiple times. And so the way you might resort to solving that, at least personally, is to go the route of writing a bash script or something similar uh, that uses tools like grab or sad to fix things on a regular basis. But that means you need to use regular expressions and similar things to kind of uh, duct tape things together. And at least I don't feel that confident with regular expressions as much as I used them in the past. There's always things where it was either too flexible or too strict and I kept fiddling around with it and it wasn't catching the right things. And that means we're building tools that are unreliable and hard to maintain uh, to deal with our code bases. And that's not a great feeling, at least for me personally. But that also gets me back to the tools that we use on a regular basis, because all of these have something in common with find and replace. And that is they take some code, uh, run some magic on it and produce some output. And I want to talk to you about exactly that said magic. And in order to talk to you about that magic, uh, we first need to talk about how the compiler works, because effectively all of these tools use the same concept under the hood. Uh, if you've never worked with a compiler or never looked at how a compiler works under the hood, uh, that's okay. We'll still cover it step by step, so you should be able to keep up. Um, the first thing here is we have some input. In this case, for example, new symbol one and the compiler will perform what is called a lexical analysis on that. That means it will turn that text into a set of tokens, so a list of tokens representing the different parts of the code that we have. You can imagine this being the equivalent of taking a text written in English and then turning it into a list of words and punctuations. And then the next step is to perform syntax analysis on this. So that means we're taking the tokens that we already have and creating some structure around them in the shape of an AST, so an abstract syntax tree um, that represents how the program is actually structured. So imagine this as if you're turning words and punctuation into sentences representing uh, as part of paragraphs and those sentences contain information of what uh, what part is the subject what part is a verb you know and giving all of that detailed information rather than just having a list of words and punctuations and then you can perform actions on those asts but then the last step is code generation so that means we're taking the ast and we're turning that into some output so this can be machine code this can be another programming language um, but generally we're turning it into some sort of output 
So now that we talked about how those general steps work uh, in, in the grander scheme of things, let's dive into each of these steps a bit more into detail. So the first step is lexical analysis. You might also hear about it as tokenization. So that means we're taking some example code, and I don't want to use the classic hello world here. So instead, I'm going to use uh, a function called ESPanda because I love pandas. And um, it receives one argument, in this case, a string with a panda emoji in it. And we want to turn this into tokens. So you could build your own tokenizer, but there's plenty of tokenizers, especially for JavaScript, that you can use. In my case, I'm going to use Esprima, and I'm going to call tokenize on that. And that will give us a list of tokens. Uh, so that will look roughly like this. I dropped a couple of pieces of information here to fit it on the slide, like what are the line numbers and, and things like that. But roughly, this is what you would get. Um, four tokens, one is an identifier, is panda, um, two punctuators, an opening and a closing parenthesis, uh, and in between it is a string that has uh, the string value of a panda. Now, this information, if you've ever written a... Um, code editor theme or generally like a syntax highlighting theme, you might be familiar with these words of identifier, punctuator, string, because that's typically what is being used in real real practical examples such as syntax highlighting. Uh, so most code editors use tokenization at some point to do some syntax highlighting. Some do additional work on top of that for more advanced highlighting. But under the hood, at least the basic syntax highlighting is often done by tokenization. The token formats might differ though. So for example, VS Code did some uh, extra work to do very uh, to do um, performance improvements on uh, the syntax highlighting and tokenization part of things. And if you want to read about that, you can check out this blog post. Uh, but once we have those tokens, the next step would be to turn these tokens into an abstract syntax tree. So that is the syntax parsing side of things. So we take this list of tokens or list of objects and we turn them into a nested object that represents sort of a tree of how our pro uh, program is structured. So at the top we have a program and then that has a body which in this case only has one expression statement which has a call expression in it that consists out of a callee which is what is being called and a set of arguments in this case only one argument which is a literal of a panda emoji. Uh, the format that you've seen there is called ESTree. Um, it's a spec that was derived of the AST format that Mozilla uses internally in their Spider Monkey engine, uh, but it has been altered and extended from there. So if you're using tools like Esprima or Babel, um, they use derivatives offset spec, but with some additions that help them with their functionality and goals. Um, and also Facebook and others have extended this to add functionality like JSX and others into the language. Uh, to give you some practical examples of why you would want to have an AST in the first place is to visit the different nodes to do things such as linting. So if you if you build a linter or use a linter such as ESLIN, TSLint, or JSHint, um, you would want to do analysis often not just purely on the format of your code, but you want more detailed rules that could, for example, be around how you name your classes. And rather than having to look through an entire array to try to find the class keyword somewhere and then see what's following, instead you could navigate a tree and look for class decorators, uh, class uh, declarations and then see how they fit into the grander scheme so you can do much more advanced linting rules. Uh, another example that sort of fits into that sound, same realm is code analysis. So for example, Angular uses this to build a language service that you can use in your code editor to get better autocomplete. The way they're doing that is by turning their HTML templates into ASTs and then being able to tell you based on where your cursor is and how your template is connected to your to your component, what things are available and improve your autocomplete there. Another example is bundling. So if you've used a bundler like Webpack or Parcel before, those are using ASTs under the hood. Because while bundling in the past might have been just uh, uh, concatenating JavaScript files, these days in, in the world of Compo uh, components and modules and things like that, 
uh, you need to understand how often, how things fit together and you can do one on the one hand optimizations on this but you can also better uh, you know fit things together without um, uh, adding them in the wrong order and things like that and so that is exactly where ASTs come into place the nice thing though about ASTs is that they are not only helpful when you're traversing the code, but they're also incredibly helpful for modifying themselves. Because if you've ever had to modify a um, text or a list versus modifying an object, you might know that it's easier to modify the object, especially if you have to take things out in the middle of a program, in the middle of an object versus taking things out of the middle of an array or the middle of a text. So let's look at our AST again. And in this case, we can actually do an optimization here that would be a good use for modifying an AST. Um, so if we look at the expression statement, we have one expression in it, it's a call expression. And it, uh, really, we can see that if you uh, call is panda and you give it the value of a panda emoji, it will always be true. So we can actually do an improvement here and take out that expression and replace it with just a literal that has the value true in it and therefore significantly shrinking our code. And if you would do that same execution across your entire code base, you know, you would eliminate a bunch of code. Um, so there's a bunch of practical examples, but the one that might be most, uh, most familiar to you if you're writing JavaScript these days is Babel. So Babel actually uses that concept in uh, all of their transformations, whether you're down transpiling or you're um, using some of the additional plugins that people have built. If you're not familiar with Babel, it's a down transpiler that allows you to take code that you might have used in a um, uh, written in more modern JavaScript and transpile it to ES5 or ES3 compatible JavaScript or compatible to exactly the browsers that you're targeting. Um, but you can also do things like extending a language. So as I said, JSX does this where really we're just having a, an AST that has these JSX tags in it and then we modify it to turn those JSX tags into function calls because that's really how JSX is implemented is um, all of these tags are being turned into function calls to things like react.createElement or preact's h function. And then the third example is language transpiling. Uh, so that means we're taking a language such as TypeScript and um, we're removing all of the TypeScript specific syntax so we can turn it into some JavaScript code uh, that we can then execute. Now, obviously TypeScript does a bunch of other things as well, but that's for example, how the Babel transform for TypeScript works. Uh, the one that I thought was really cool is code coverage. If you've used code coverage in the past, uh, such as Istanbul, for example, you might have uh, wondered how it actually works under the hood, how it plugs into things. And um, the way it does it, we can actually look under the hood uh, and that we can do that using the NYC CLI from Istanbul by calling NYC instrument, giving it a, giving it a file and then giving it an output directory and looking at the output. Uh, so let's say we have a SumJS file that we want to unit test and we want to see how good our test coverage is. We have this function in it called sum that takes two parameters and adds it up and then we export that function. Now if we run NYC instrument on this, this is the code that we get out of it. We have a variable declaration at the top that we'll look at in a second. And then we have um, three added counter incrementers added to it. So we have two that uh, end with S0 and S1 and one with F0. And those are function and statement counters. Um, and basically that means if we're running our unit test against this file instead, we're able to actually tell um, how often functions have been called, how often statements have been called, because we can then look into that object that is at the top and there's a coverage data object as part of this that contains all of these counters for each of those segments, uh, for each of these statements, functions, and branches. Uh, and also it contains a statement map, a function map, and a branch map, so that later we can look at what are the statements, functions, and branches that have zero counters, and then uh, inform the user exactly which ones haven't been called and where they are. 
Now, if you want to learn more about the code coverage aspect, um, there's a great blog post that I recommend, recommend you to read that dives a bit more into that AST transformation. Another example is running other languages and browsers. So I'm not talking about WebAssembly here, um, but instead um, I'm talking about a pretty concrete example of code combat. So I worked on code combat um, a couple of years ago as a uh, Google Summer of Code. And one thing they do is they aim at teaching kids how to code using different programming languages, such as Python or uh, JavaScript or CoffeeScript or Lua. And they don't, they execute all of the code inside the browser, but they're doing that without shipping a, an entire Python runtime or an entire CoffeeScript runtime. Instead, they use a tool called Esper that they built that takes some Python code, for example, on the left and converts that into an AST that looks similar to the JavaScript one and then modify that, uh, that AST to fix function calls that might be different in JavaScript. Uh, so for example, we have a print function call here, which the equivalent would be console log. So on the right side in the AST, you can actually see there's a call expression to console log. And um, it also gives you some additional information so that they can do frame execution and kind of like st uh, step through things without having uh, to teach kids how a debugger works. But all of that is powered by ASTs, and that's super powerful. It's not performant necessarily. You're not, you wouldn't want to do this to execute production code in the browser, but I still think it's a very cool application. Once you've modified your AST, the last step is rendering your AST. Uh, so that means we're turning it into output. So we have, for example, our optimized AST here now, and we want to turn that into some code. So we'll use a library such as ES Code Gen that knows how to turn an AST into some uh, code. And then we just get the statement true because that's how we optimized it. There are some really practical examples that I personally love using. Uh, one of them is called Prettier. Uh, if you haven't used Prettier, it's a code formatting tool. If you've used Prettier, you might have been as excited about it as I am. And the reason why it works so well is because it takes your code, converts it into an AST, and then reprints it based on its own instructions, which means that it doesn't really care in which way you wrote your initial code, or it doesn't screw up your code by writing it in the wrong way. Um, it doesn't just randomly insert new lines. Instead, it fully understands your code and just prints it based on the rules you gave it. And so that's really cool. And minification works in a very similar way. Like it's just taking an AST and they might do some modifications on the AST to change variable names or similar things. But then it just prints it out into a minified way uh, rather than just removing white spaces because that could cause trouble in some situations. Um, but let's say you're not planning to build the next Webpack or ba uh, Babel or similar. Why would you care about this? One of the good examples that I think we can all, we might all be able to leverage are Babel Transform plugins. You don't necessarily have to build one for a new cutting edge feature. Those can be useful for just improving your own day-to-day uh, -day developer experience um, without having to use grab or sed and without having to use regular expressions or at least less regular expressions. Um, a good similar example is what React did. React has a project called React Code Mod that is powered by another tool that Facebook built called JS Code Shift, which works similar to uh, Babel in terms of like building transform plugins. Um, but they have an entire library of different scripts that you can run to um, update your code base for the latest React APIs and similar things. And so that is super useful because if you feel like you're doing something on a regular basis or you want to have certain macros as part of your code base, you know, as your code base is growing, these tools can be hugely useful for you. Um, and so I figured rather than talking uh, more about this, we would actually build a plugin together. So this is a website called AST Explorer that uh, I personally love using to understand how ASTs work and play around with them. So let's clean up some things here. Um, the 
top left corner is uh, where we put our input code. The bottom right corner is where our output code is. The top right is uh, where we see the AST. And then on the bottom left, we can change, uh, build our transform plugin. Uh, we chose here already the Bab Babylon 7 um, parser. That's the one that Babel uses. And then we have um, Babel v7 here as the transform. You can, uh, for example, choose JS code shift here. And so if you're a JavaScript developer like me, chances are high you use console log to um, you know, debug your things. But I was thinking the other day of like D console log is sort of like the general debugging way, then I would say breakpoints is probably alerting. Um, so let's use this alert statement here. Sorry for that. Um, and what we want to do is we want to make sure we're not actually shipping any alert statements to our customers. Because while they might be useful for us during development, we definitely don't want them to break the experience for customers. So we're going to build a Babel plugin that will remove or change all alert statements to console errors. So we don't have to worry about them and they just pop up in the logs. Uh, the way we do this uh, is by defining a visitor here. So visitors are um, different functions based on different types of nodes that Babel might encounter so that we can tell it what to do during those. So if we actually click on alert here, we can see it's an identifier, but it's wrapped in a call expression. And this call expression is really what we're interested in. Um, and so we're going to create a visitor here called call expression. And it's a function that receives a path every time it was encountered. That's what we get. And so the first thing we want to do here uh, is let's just rename uh, name this. So path.node, and then if we go here, the callee is what we want to change. Uh, so we're going to create a new identifier here. I'm just going to call this console.error. And now we can see on the right here that we have console.error apply to both of these, not just cons, not just to alert. And that means we need to first filter what we're actually doing. So I'm going to actually filter for, I'm going to do sort of like what is called an early exit. So um, I'm going to check if we have an identifier as part of the callee that has a name of alert. And because I said we're going to do an early exit, I actually want to return if this is not the case. So if we don't have an identifier with the alert statement, I forgot a closing parenthesis here, um, then we want to change it to console error. So now you can see console log state, but console error didn't. Uh, alert didn't, so change it to console error. Um, and this works even if we have this inside a function, for example. So if we do alert here, uh, we can see it's still adjusting that. So that's great. But And similarly, you know, if we would break this up over multiple lines, this is still working. We didn't have to work around, you know, any formatting things like you would have to when you write a regular expression, for example. Uh, now, the problem, though, comes when we do things such as, um, for example, redefining a local function here that just throws an error, for example, or let's do return alert. Uh, so this this is just a local function that we define, meaning that this alert here is actually 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 right. Like we want to keep this um, and not replace this with console error. So the cool thing with tools like Babel and others that are AST powered is we have much more understanding of the code. This will be really hard to do with uh, just regular expressions and token uh, tokenization, for example. But uh, in the case of Babel, we have access to the scope, and that means we can check for bindings, which means, um, is there a binding for the word alert here? Uh, and if there is, we just want to return. So that means the alert inside this run function is never actually changed, while the global one is still being changed. We can take this one step further. I don't like the fact that you know, we still have an alert here and that could cause some confusion uh, in the output. So what we're going to do is we actually going to rename inside the scope, uh, we're going to rename alert. 
And what this is going to do is it's going to change alert to a unique name. Uh, in this case, that still is as close to alert as possible. So it starts by putting an underscore there. Um, but if we would, for example, define a variable here now called alert underscore alert, it would change it to alert two. And then similarly, if we would have another one here, alert two, it would change it to alert three and similar. It, it will always try to avoid a clash in the in the respective scope in which we rename this. So that's super useful because um, we don't have to worry about creating clashing variable names as we're changing our code here. Um, similarly, you know, we can, for example, modify the code entirely if we see the global ones and we just remove the node. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can insert other things. You can modify things based on various different rules. If you want to learn all of the different things you can do with it, I would recommend you to check out the Babel plugin handbook because um, as much as it hasn't been edited for a while, there's a lot of really useful information in there in terms of what you can do, how you can replace you know, one node with multiple nodes, how you can uh, replace it with a source string if you don't want to build an entire uh, entire tree just by using additional uh, nodes and generating those. So there's a lot of things you can do, and I recommend you to check out that handbook if you're interested in exploring more things you can do with it. All right, let's get back into the slides um, to wrap things up. So in summary, there's a few things I want you to take away. One, you already use tokens and ASTs daily. They're in all of the tools basically that make your life easier. Uh, tokens represent format. You know, they're representing how your code is written. And ASTs represent the structure. They don't care if you used uh, curly braces around your if statement or if you used wrote it in one line. That also makes ASTs easier to manipulate because you do not have to worry about what parts are code syntax and what parts are um, actual statements. And it makes it safer for cold alterations because you can just take out a node and put a new node in rather than having to see if you're removing the right amount of elements from an array or uh, removing the right parts of a string. Uh, ES3 is there for interoperability. So a lot of different tools use ES3 as the foundation of their AST. Um, and that means you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of tools to create ASTs, a lot of tools to walk ASTs, and a lot of tools to render ASTs. And you can use all of these different tools to build either your own tools that you might share with the community or just internal things that are gonna be useful for you um, as you're building your apps. Uh, because that means you can replace things like grab or said when you're modifying your code. If you want to learn more about ASTs, I would recommend you to check out the AST Explorer and just play around with it. You know, put some code in, try to figure out what you're trying to change, uh, click on things because it will highlight the different parts of the AST, um, play around with different parsers and see what kind of information they give you. There's a lot of fun things to do. Um, and then read the Babel plugin handbook. Even if you're not planning to build your own Babel plugin, if you want to learn more about ASTs, it's a, it's a great thing to, to read. The nice thing is also all of the things I showed you are open source, which means that now that you know what ASTs are, you can look for them in the different tools that you're using or different code bases to see what's actually happening under the hood. I also wrote a blog post about this topic if you wanna rather read up on this um, in, in the shape of a blog post. It covers a lot of the same things that I covered in this talk, but um, if you prefer reading it, uh, that's a good format. And with that, if you want to check out the slides, I uploaded them on the on this URL at the left. And I'll also tweet about them later. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. As I said, you can reach me anywhere on the internet at dkundal. So feel free to send me an email or send me a DM on Twitter. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and have a great day.